You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is Flex and Herds bringing you your murder mystery world tour. It's time to step off the boat, step off the plane. We are on our second stop for 2020 Herds. Welcome to New Zealand. I'm surprised you didn't say step off the train, but I guess it'd be kind of difficult to it get would to be New Zealand a bit difficult to get via there. train. Yes. Um, but you're right. Maybe our, our boat train will be here. We'll get those <laughs> next year. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's time for Money in the Morgue Flex. That is the novel that I'm challenging you to solve yes. uh, in part one today of our, of our discussion on the novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, of course, by by Naira Marsh, who is one of the, one of the four queens of crime. This is, of course, by Naira Marsh, who is one of the four queens of crime, um, which, of course, how we're tying into Agatha Christie because them mm-hmm, queens mm-hmm. of crime don't quit. Uh, but this novel is a little bit, it's a little bit different. Yes. Uh, it is the 33rd of the uh, Inspector Allen uh, mysteries written by Naira Marsh, but this particular novel was begun during World War II, abandoned, and then picked up after her death uh, by Stella Duffy. Um, originally, there were only three chapters and some kind of general notes on how the plot would progress and how the mystery would be played out, that sort of thing. Uh, and Stella Duffy had taken up the challenge uh, of publishing this in, in 2018, the fully realized uh, 33rd and probably final mystery for Alan to, to kind of solve yes. here. Yes. Um, and it's, it's now 37 chapters. It's it's true. It's quite long. So congratulations to Stella Duffy. I, I appreciate the work you've got into to yeah. make this this little masterpiece happen. 37 chapters, though, is probably not not the longest book we've covered on the show, probably even not. by a stretch, because they are relatively short chapters I was and gonna say, relatively well packaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't seem to drag so much. Although mm. I will say, when I first read this novel, the opening chapters, the opening kind of, I would say, first act, the first yes. third, I think drags a little bit. Well, because that first third we're talking about is chapters one to eleven. Yes, one to eleven out of thirty-seven, um, because there's a very lovely stopping point where the the character the we're flying literally says, "This would be a very good spot for Act One to end." Yep. Uh, so obviously that's where we're ending for our for our first episode. I suppose talking of Act One, it's worth bringing up that this is a very stage-minded book. Yes, yes, this novel is focused on. The Dramatis Personae, which I've, I, it's a term I've mentioned a couple of times on this show, but the Dramatis Personae, it's a theatre term mm-hmm. uh, really just referring to the list of characters that are going to be in the play um, or in the story. And in my mind, this is specifically referring to, you know, the major characters and their relationships yeah. with each other. This is what you're really focusing on, the dramatic persons in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're given a nice little list at the start of the novel too. To, yeah. I suppose we should introduce uh, Detective Allen. Sure, uh, in, I, if in, you like to. He's Inspector. Uh, Inspector yeah. Roderick Allen is actually a UK-based detective in yes. most of Marsh's books. I think there's two or three, including this one, where he's actually in New Zealand, which is uh, mm. Marsh's home country. Of course. Um, but basically, the setup for this novel is that he has been sent here on an undercover mission regarding some suspicious radio signals and has found himself at a military base uh, that those radio signals seem to have pointed to when all of a sudden uh, an old man dies and... and and the matron of the hospital that he's staying at seems to be found dead as well. And all of the money is missing. Yes. Uh, Mr. Glossop is uh, one of the, I would say, the most important character in this novel. Definitely. Uh, he is the the driver who is to take the money from the hospital that they're at right now um, to, to other hospitals that need to have their, their you know, pay brought in. Um, and he's been stuck at this hospital for quite some time mm-hmm. because of a bum van. Um, the tires is flat. And it's very dangerous trying to travel through New Zealand with a tire that does not work properly. Um, he's been complaining about this for quite some time, which is why he's the most fantastic character because all he does is complain, and it's it's wonderful. <laughs> it is great. Um, but yeah, so the the money that he has been charged with safeguarding disappears from right under his nose, um, out from the safe in the matron's office, uh, and the matron is of course found deceased uh, in a body a, bag that a was body bag that was allegedly died. meant to be for the old man who yes. died. Yes, who was very definitely strange. not murdered. Interesting, interesting thought. The matron, dubious. The oh. old man, definitely murdered. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll get into that more in the in the second That's part, right. I suppose, for the theories there. Yes. Um. But yeah, I don't know. I I find it very interesting, as I was saying, that we spend so much time setting up mm. characters who are not the detective. Um. This makes sense, of course, because it's the thirty third in the series. Yes. Maybe you're familiar with Alan, but I think especially for a murder mission of like this, the fact that Naira Marsh spent so much time 
ironing out the, the specific relationships within mm-hmm. all of the characters. I find that very commendable. I really, I really enjoy that, you know? It's particularly strange if you look at the first three chapters and how that sets up what's going on as opposed to the later chapters. A lot of the reviews that I've read of this book, um, mm-hmm. which were all vetted for spoilers, don't worry. Um, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> I got you. All were very divided on whether... Stella Duffy bridged the gap between her own writing mm. and Nio Marsh's effectively. Mm. And I'll, I'll spoil it for you now, Herds. We are, in fact, going to be visiting Nio Marsh proper <gasps> as our next book to actually get that comparison down. Excellent, excellent. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that over the coming weeks. But mm. I think regardless of whether you think the styles were bridged effectively, the story as a whole flows very consistently. Yeah. Speaking as the, the veteran here of the episode, I, I think that definitely by the end of the story, um, even though some elements of fair play may not line up, like, you know what? Who knows, Flex? Maybe you'll blow me away and okay. get everything 100% right. But uh, <laughs> I think that the story itself, flowing from the first three chapters all the way to the end, mm-hmm. I kind of loved it. Alan, as an inspector, is fantastic, though. We'll, we'll talk more about that um, as we get to see more of him, obviously. Um, but I, I think that the, uh, the actual flow of the story from one event to the next is performed almost seamlessly. I, I, really, I really appreciate sort of his talent in that regard as a writer. Yeah, I think the only gripe that I really have with the writing of this story is that there's a lot of times that phrases feel repeated. Mm. And I don't know, I don't want to say that that's a bad thing about the book because part of me suspects that it may be a clue that comes back later down along the line, particularly mm. when, you know, we get to a lot of the references to, you know, Shakespearean works and a lot of characters using the same turn of phrase as the same reaction. Sure. And part of me thinks that like, because I think there's a little bit of a conspiracy going on here, but I'm not mm. too sure about it. Maybe, maybe. That maybe there's like some code phrases in there that I'm meant to be following and that's why things are repeated but there's also some characters that I don't think would make sense to use them Maybe, but as far as details go that is extraordinarily nitpicky and the one thing I did enjoy is that even though it takes until effectively chapter 10 to actually find the crime yeah like we've still gotten a lot done. We've had a lot of suspicious things happen. We've had a lot of interactions that I think are very, very easy hooks for how things are going to tie together later down the line. Yeah. I definitely, you you can take a very, I mean, obviously I've set this up, but you can take a very good crack at figuring out, you know, who among the Dematis Personae is guilty or innocent based on the various interactions that we see. One of the ones that's most vivid in my mind is is Rosamond yes. coming, uh, coming up on uh, Murray Sanders, I believe it is. And there is there is history there. They were like together, but now they're not together. And she's like all high and up about it. And she's got her winnings from the races. And it's like, like there's a lot of detail packed into a simple like, oh, I was, you know, walking along and I saw these idiots, you know, who were supposed to be lying in bed, but they're running around outside the hospital compound. Um, And it should be mentioned, of course, that beyond the character dynamics and coming to understand what every person kind of wants and desires, Mm. um, another element that's really kind of important is is the environment. We do the classic, we're trapped here by a storm. Exactly. That's exactly the thing, right? Like, it is at once a very traditional murder mystery um, with the, the storm and like that the bridge has been blown out and all this other stuff. Um, and oh, we can't, we can't get a hold of anyone. What do we do? You know? Uh, but it also feels very, it feels very palatable with the way that Stella Duffy actually writes the story. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to this one flex. I'm looking forward to see if you can solve this mystery. I will tell you right now, if I'm solving it, it's not going to be today. Okay. Fair enough. You know it's, it's just not happening. I ain't going to fight you. But I think you got a good crack. The body was only revealed to us moments ago. I know, but there's been so much lead up to this moment. <sighs> I'm, I'm telling you, Herds, we're going to come back <laughs> in in the next part or part three, depending yeah. on how successful I find myself. Mm-hmm. And it's either going to be that this episode is all about just rubbish nonsense character diatribe that ends yep. up having a couple of mild things that hook in or just the entire crime can be solved in the first part with like one extra clue that's in part two Yep, and I'm just missing it entirely right. and I'm so excited to find that out. Look, I'll let you know, I normal rules apply. If you can figure out the who, the how, and the why done at each point, um, if, if you are able to pin down exactly what is going on here, I'll leave a little bit of leeway. If you're able to pin down exactly who every every character or characters that are involved, I will I will give you another point. That is, that is on the table right now. Herds, I do have to ask you. I've, yeah. I've offered you two points for last week. You've offered me two points for this week. Do we just want to make this year double or nothing? 
You know what? I'm in. Okay. I'm down for it. Double or nothing. Double or nothing. Let's do it. <laughs> You're listening to Death of the Reader. We'll be back in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. And Herds, mm, here thanks. on your Murder Mystery World Tour, I wanted to try something new today. Oh, I, love, I love new things. It I love is new days. It is 2020. New Year's. It is our second book of the year. And I wanted to try... Uh, Bring some news to the table. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had a few questions over on social media at Flex and Herds, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter about how we can keep up with uh you know with the crime fiction world when uh you know we're typically covering a lot of older stuff, a lot of golden age stuff. You know, Money in the Mortgage we're covering today is the most recent thing we've covered, so I thought it was an appropriate time to bring in the modern world of mm-hmm. crime fiction to the show and talk a bit about how uh, how I keep up with it and, sure. you know, how to keep on top yeah. of it. The, the answer is with too much effort. And so that's why we're doing this this, <laughs> this segment. <laughs> yeah, I think particularly with uh, films like Knives Out and, uh, you know, Kenneth Branagh's Poirot adaptations, there's obviously a little bit of a resurgence in interest mm. in the Golden Age murder mystery. I would mystery. say so. I would say so. Um, and I think that it's really good to look at modern reinterpretations of that. Money in the Morgue is a fantastic example so far, and I'm excited to get further into that. Mm. Um, I also think, you know, Knives Out was fantastic. Uh, Murder on the Orient Express by Kenneth Branagh was not <laughs> stellar, but it was entertaining. We'll have to watch that at some point. Uh, well, we will be challenging uh, Sean Britton to, right. uh, to Death on the Nile later this year mm. when uh, the subsequent uh, Poirot adaptation by Kenneth Branagh comes out. Um, but I think the one that is coming up the soonest uh, that I wanted to talk about, at least in the film sphere, is uh, Franny Fisher's uh, Miss Fisher and the Crypt of Tears. Now, Herds, I don't know if you're familiar with Franny Fisher, but Franny Fisher is Vaguely. femme fatale Sherlock Holmes in Australia. Yes, I know that she carries a golden gun, which seems like not a good idea if you're a, you know, a detective trying to blend in or uh-huh. like seduce your target or whatever like look i'm just saying guns is good because a lady got to keep herself safe but a golden gun like what are you doing yeah my family is tension. is big into miss fish's murder mysteries really uh the only the only version of clue or cluedo that we are allowed to play is miss fish's cluedo mm. um uh-huh and I think the show is fantastic fun, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing it on the big screen with that upcoming adaptation, which we'll be covering after our next novel. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it comes out two weeks, uh, the 27th of February. Apparently it's set in the, the exotic land of the, the Arabian deserts. She's finding treasure I think, or something. I think it's from insane. the shorts it does a little bit of traveling, so I'm looking forward to yeah. getting that movie on the show. A little bit of globe Um driving. The other thing that I've really been enjoying, jumping away from the movie sphere, obviously mm. those films are coming out later this year and we'll always have information up on social media uh, when we're talking about those, but I've been really impressed recently actually with uh, The Guardian. Mm. Uh, international publication has been putting out a good bit of uh, crime fiction stories on its website. I have seen a little bit of this. Yeah. I know that they're putting up some very intriguing uh, reviews. Might be a strong word, but yeah. impressions of some some of the excellent uh, murder mystery novels that are coming out. Um, uh, I the one that has most intrigued me. I haven't had a chance to read it, but the Lamises by Declan Burke mm. uh, has perhaps the most unique cover of a book that I have seen in a long time. It's just it's just various like. Ben, are glasses you, and bottles and are things. Are you judging a book by its cover right yes, now? Yes, I am. On Death because, of the because so many of them are the same thing. They look all the same. But this one <laughs> is like a series of like wine glasses and bottles and things. Mm-hmm. And I could not tell you what the Lamas is about. Um, but apparently it has a very metafictional context or tone. Interesting. Insane. Interesting. I want to read that. I want, we're doing that on the show. I'm telling you. That's a promise. All right. I think the other thing uh, that has been very interesting up on The Guardian uh, was a piece by Francesca Wade about the uh, Detection Club. Mm. Obviously, we're big fans of the Detection Club around here, even though The Floating Admiral is an awful book <laughs> that you, <laughs> you should, should absolutely read. read. You should never absolutely read it. Terrible read idea. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll have links up on the podcast for that. And shout out, as always, to Ronald Knox, who everyone seems to write about, but no one seems to have read. <laughs> <laughs> like, the more articles I read yes. on the man, the more sad I feel, because it's like, oh, everyone just knows the rules. Yeah, it's it's kind of fascinating. Ronald Knox is quoted much more often than anybody kind of understands what his works were about and how, yeah. like, flippant they were, how silly they were. He's very much a historical oddity, as we discussed yes. in our very first episode on the show when we talked about the three taps. Yes, which is good to revisit. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, particularly when we look at, you know, his broadcast that terrified London listeners that was kind of a spiritual predecessor to War of the Worlds or, you know, his rule set. Um, but if you actually go and look at some of the things he read, he was a he was an expert on how people read books, I think. Yeah. Um, and we talk about that in our episode. But the other thing that I found since then was a fascinating uh, discourse between uh, Ronald Knox and I believe C.S. Lewis, mm. uh, which was actually separate from crime fiction. I believe it was a, a religion uh, discussion, but I uh-huh. got absolutely hooked into that when we were, uh, when we'd finished uh, the three taps last year. Um, and there's definitely some interesting things if you kind of dig a bit further into Ronald Knox. So always shout out to our hero, our Lord and savior. Mm. Is that, is that blasphemy to call um, uh, Father Ronald Knox I, look, our Lord and savior? Here's the thing. I don't think that <laughs> Knox would mind. I think he's a, he's such a good tempered individual with a great sense um, of humor yeah yeah um i'd also like to shout out the mystery tribune there's a fantastic article i found on there recently about scott alderberg's love of locked room mysteries uh the crooked hinge by john dixon carr as yes. an example that he uses there and it's a really fantastic exploration of uh the importance of uh locked room mysteries including murder on the orient express and and then there were none excellent, excellent stories I think in terms of books that I'm actually looking forward to at the moment, uh, Andrea Camilleri's uh, Inspector Montalbano's mm. uh, series is continuing uh, with its 25th novel. The 24th came out just towards the end of last year, and we're already getting another one in April this year, and I'm very excited. I really, really uh, love kind of the the charm of these. It's been ad- adapted for a BBC series, I believe, that I haven't actually caught yet. Um but there's, there's a very quaint charm to it. I mean, even if you, uh, here we go, looking at covers again, uh, just look at some of the covers of these books. Uh, yeah. The upcoming book, The Safety Net, has this wonderful like film set showing on the front cover that yeah. has me very excited for what kind of filmmaking antics we're going to get into in the series. It's one of those funny things, isn't it? You can never judge a book by its cover, but... But it's marketing, right? But it's, it's part of the appeal. It's the only thing that you've seen of the book when you see, you know, five books that have, you know, a picture of some landscape and it's, you know, dark color with the text mm. in front, light colored, like usually like a sun rising or a skyline and then a dark color down the bottom where you put like buy this author or starring yeah. this or whatever. I believe like, the premise for the, uh, for the new, uh, for the new Andrea Camilleri novel is something along the lines of a Swedish television show is in town great. making it. Sounds and great. I'm very excited to see what goofy gimmicks we can get into with a Swedish television show in Sicily. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that sounds a little bit strange. I like it. Um, yeah, give me those weird wacky mm. stories. And while while we're on the topic of covers actually, I did mm. want to uh I did want to talk about, you know, the thumbnails that we use for episodes on YouTube and up mm. on the podcast. It's always so difficult to pick particularly with old novels between the enormous variety of covers they've had. <laughs> they have um I remember Caves of Steel had about I want to say 20 different covers yeah. for that novel depending on what like time period it was re-released in and so many of them made absolutely no sense if you actually read the book it was so good it was clearly just like a generic sci-fi art that had been commissioned kind of analogous (laughs) to the book no it was great i mean that leads into the themes or the the visual imagery of that book where it was always very vaguely described yes absolutely it was always very evocative but you were never sure quite what of yes excellent that is a fantastic way to put that (laughs) Before we close out today's segment, um, you know, we'll bring this back with perhaps some more specific information as we kind of get into the grind of more regular news now that we've introduced this. Sure. Um, but we hope that this has given you kind of a palette to look at if you're interested in finding more about the murder mystery world. If you're interested in more up-to-date uh, book coverage rather than the golden age nonsense that we're doing and some of the news we're bringing. Let us know. Honestly, like if you're enjoying this segment, if you want to hear 
more news about what's going on in the world of murder mission. It's like up to date and current. Let mm-hmm. us know at Flex and Nerds. Yes. Your feedback matters. We also have our good friend Andrew Popel bringing you final draft every week here on 2SER. Mm-hmm. Uh, the episode originally airs every Saturday and then is replayed, I believe, on Wednesday morning and evening. Yes. Uh, so there's always some fantastic book coverage around here on 2SER. Keep an eye out for it. We are going to jump back over to Money in the Morgue yes. by Stella Duffy and Nio Marsh. That's the news, the crime fiction. We need a name for this segment. Uh, oh, we'll have to work. We'll have to work. I don't know that. what that is. The news, the news you can use. That's a tagline. That's, it, that's not a title. That's it a tagline. Needs, it needs a bit more death in it. The stabs, cutting, cutting through the fat. Uh, uh, mm. I feel I like know. something like cutting edge is cutting probably edge. taken. Yeah, like that's the problem. You gotta find something like we'll work on compelling. this. We should just jump back to the book. I think. All right, get back to it. <laughs> get back to that money in the mall. You're listening to Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is your murder mystery world tour. This week on the show, we are talking part one. Chapters 1 to 11 of Nio Marsh and Stella Duffy's Money in the Morgue. It is me on the new fresh meat end this time around. And I have got to solve a murder that happened literal seconds ago. Good, good luck. I'm scared, Hurts. I'll let you know. I was just reading through the Jamas Personae. There are 16 characters named. Now, that includes uh, the, the matron and an old Mr. Mr. Brown uh-huh. and the inspector, of course. And but the that's grunts. Still, it includes the grunts. Yes. It includes everybody. But that still leaves you with a good 13 potential suspects to, to sort through. I'm very um, excited. I will, I will tell you right out the gate, Herds. I do not think I can do this this week. What? I think that there is a bit of information that I'm missing here. Roderick yeah. Allen is in the country because of supposedly Japanese mini-subs sending supposed coordinates about this supposed hospital in supposedly New Zealand with supposedly a bunch of veteran soldiers. Uh, and part of me wouldn't be surprised if it turns out that Roderick Allen has shown up in in the like the wrong country, <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of actors, and that's why we keep talking he's about actually, acting. Are you telling me he's actually in a simulation orchestrated by the commies to, to get information out I, of him? I feel like simulation is, that is going? simulation is a bit much no. for the for the nineteen thirties and forties. Well, it doesn't need to be a technical simulation. It could be just you know. Like uh, you know, like a, one of those those towns that like yeah, to no, bomb that, that's, with bomb. that's what I'm saying. You know? I'm I'm just making sure that we are using simulation in a term that people understand yes. because we so often associate it with the virtual realities no, and whatnot no, no, these no. days. Not a virtual simulation, just no. a regular simulation. A bunch of actors around here all acting strange. Listen, I want to know why he's being sent out here all by himself without his, you know, dear Inspector Fox. Mm. You know, he's writing letters back to Fox. He's writing letters back to Troy. Yeah, yeah. So far, he hasn't received any correspondence. I think that this could all just be a big ruse, Herds. No, how could it be a ruse? We can't, we can't do that twice in a row. That doesn't work. Look, it's because he's in deep cover. He cannot allow the people at the hospital to know that. You know, those New Zealanders can't trust them. That's that's what he's operating off of. Only the British men. Uh huh. Those are the only people that that Alan could trust. All right. That's well, how it be. In that case, Hertz, if we're going to pretend that this isn't just a simulation laid out we're not by, by the Axis powers to disable the great Roderick Allen, uh-huh. I think that I have no clue what's going on. Oh, really? Because Fascinating. Clearly, what? clearly Sidney Brown has murdered his grandfather. Okay, cool. Th- there is no contention in my why, mind. Why do you believe that, sir? Why do you believe? We'll get to that, Hertz. Okay, so you, hold on. So you're saying, I have no idea what's going on, hoop doop doop but I think this. But why? I won't tell you. That's, what? That's the problem. Is I know what's happened, but I have no idea why. That's ridiculous. Because let's let us let's, let's look at this. We've got we've got Sidney Brown. Okay, sure. Who is put in for 45 minutes with his grandfather, who he's never responded to comments of before on the night that supposedly something suspicious is going to happen and the night that Roderick Allen is supposedly supposed to be there, mm. walks out after his grandfather has died conveniently within the first 45 minutes of him showing up despite him being sick for weeks, and then he says, no, I can't be here. Yeah, yeah. Is that not the most suspicious line that man could have said in that moment? Dude, sometimes fate just it brings things around that way. It is ludicrous to me, sir. Why would he kill his grandfather? That's I ridic- don't that's, lu- that's know. ludicrous. That's what I'm so confused about. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, obviously, he doesn't have a very good relationship with his grandfather, but, you know, if it was about the relationship with his grandfather, surely we would have seen into that room. 
All right, fair enough, fair enough. So you think that uh, the young Sidney has, has I murdered his grandfather? I know that the young Sidney has reason. murdered his grandfather because he damn well just right. told me. Well, I'm glad that you're suspicious of the young. That's that's very much going to be thematic of this novel here, I think. Okay. Um, what about what about the soldiers? You don't think they're involved at all? They're pretty like no, physically capable they're people. they're just too, they're faceless. Okay. I would even if that ends up being part of the solution, I'd feel a little cheated, honestly, if it was right. them because they don't ha- they don't have any detail. You know, we have Sergeant Bix and everyone else is just well, the true. VADs. That's not true. Some of them, they're in, like, relationships with their various various ladies. Like, well, Maurice Sanders has, like, his thing with Rosamond. And um, what are their names, Herds? They're Maurice Sanders, uh, Brayling, uh-huh. and Bob Posset. Well done, I don't Herds. remember Brayling's first name because I'm terrible at most naming things, but I remember their names. We'll get back to them in a second. Okay, fair enough. Now, the other question that we have is the matron's body... Mm-hmm. which I will note was described as cold body, yep. not cold dead body, not cold murdered body, just okay. cold body. Fair enough. And it's raining I mean, outside. It's probably, she's probably just but a But the bit... doctor checked for a pulse. <laughs> the doctor, the doctor on the scene of the crime, and which is a standard hurts. trope of this genre, went in and said, you know, touched her on the neck, was like, no, she's, she's dead. And this herds is where we start to get into dangerous territory. Are you telling me that the doctor is an accomplice? I'm, we're getting, we're getting in deep here, <laughs> oh, herds. no. So first of all, let's just go back to Glossop because okay. I mentioned earlier, I mentioned sure. earlier, he was probably okay. an unreliable narrator did, or a little confused. Insane. He sees the, the vicar leaving the matron's office just okay. before he discovers what has gone awry, which says to me that the vicar is probably the man Okay. That is responsible for the departure of that their money. Mm-hmm. With some accomplices, probably. Okay. Were they res- responsible directly for the application of what's gone on? I don't know. Okay. Interesting. But we get back to the main issue, Hertz, which is we have a bunch of soldiers who may or may not be accomplices. We have a bunch of matron who may or may not be dead. Yep. We have a bunch of money, which may or may not be missing. We have Sergeant Bix, who is the best character. We have Sergeant Bix, who is undoubtedly the best character. <laughs> no argument there. Yep. And we have a morgue that only has one entrance and one exit, mm. and the money is nowhere to be found. That's true. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe money in this day and age was made of paper. Okay. And thus it would not make sense to leave it outside in the rain. It's true. Which means it must be locked away somewhere. Oh, I think that the matron is either an accomplice okay. or was knocked out. To sure. get her key to get access to the morgue. Well, so that's that's what's interesting is that Mr. Glossop, he, uh, according to his testimony during the, the storm that occurs, mm-hmm. he, uh, he he comes, you know, outside of his, his little building there and he sees Sister Comfort yes. on the porch, who you have neglected to mention this entire time, which I find highly suspicious. Are you covering for her? Yes. Um, then the vicar enters. Yes. Uh, the porter, Will Kelly, knocks mm-hmm. uh, at the, at, this is the matron's office. And then the doctor approaches and quickly moves away from the matron's office and then the vicar and the matron leave and then that's when Glossop takes the opportunity to enter and set up his cot and, and finds the money gone. Um, now, noticeably, the matron's key is needed for the morgue. Okay. All of those characters are relatively suspicious. Okay. The door to the matron's office is left unlocked. The safe is left unlocked. Yep. I assume that the matron and and or her key were taken at that point along okay. with what was the contents of the safe. We used to open the morgue the reason the doctor rocked up there is probably because he's like, oh, it's about time for me to administer the sleepy drugs to make her seem dead. Okay. Go- goes up, realizes, oh no, I've missed my cue because it would be very acty, which, you know, a bit of a trope of this novel okay. to, to have someone miss a cue. So okay. he rocks up to the door of that office, goes, oh goodness, they must be down at the morgue already, rushes down to the morgue. Fair enough. Fair Truly enough. just guesswork at this point. No, it's okay. That's what we're here for. We're here for you to figure the it out. The doctor has either been bribed with the extra money that was taken from uh, Farson. Okay. Or as an accomplice. Okay. The vicar is a ringleader and Kelly is actually just drunk. This is very interesting. <laughs> I like that last detail tell there. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's very interesting seeing which characters you kind of are more suspicious of. Um, than I would be. I mm-hmm. actually found uh, that Sarah Warren and Rosamond to be quite the quite the interesting pair because Mr. Glossop also notes that he hears someone uh, someone shouting as though in an argument that we can't tell if it's from the records office or from the transport mm-hmm. office, which is of course where those two characters are, are staged. Yes. Um, you don't find that suspicious at all? I find it incredibly suspicious. I just don't okay. really, I don't have a strong feeling about what to go off here okay. because clearly 
This mystery is set up so that someone is going to be tied into the radio signals that Alan was brought here for. Okay. I firmly believe that I am on the right track with this. Okay. But I have no idea which way I'm facing. So you've, you've, completely, you've completely neglected the love that is in the air tonight. No, but that's my directly. job. I know it is, but still... Come on. That's right. We'll, we'll have much more to talk about yeah. next week in regards to love in the air. I, I will I will say off the cuff, just to make sure that it does not seem like I'm okay. ignoring it entirely, okay. Throw it that out maybe the reason Sanders is frosty to fasten now is because he's roped in in this conspiracy. Maybe, maybe. But that's all I have to go off. We'll have to, we'll have to find out. That we will. Mm. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Next week on the show, Herds, we are covering what chapters? We are covering chapters 12 to 23, a slightly larger chunk of the story as we drive through the interrogation phase. I'm scared, I'm yeah. confused, I'm concerned. You'll be fine. But I will solve this, Herds. Good luck, Flex. I'll be very impressed if you can. <laughs> okay, then. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds, and we will see you next week. See you.